Francis is not a monarch. 
abstract concepts that also don't exist, like the largest natural number. There is no largest natural number. This is one of Frege's examples. Um, you can tell if there is examples if they are really mathy things because he was a mathematician. Um, but yeah, these not referring singular terms don't pick anything out, but nonetheless, they're still quite meaningful. Another problem that this system runs into is identity statements that should be under normal common sense. Anything that has the same referent or object that it refers to should be interchangeable. So, for example, Clark Kent and Superman, they both refer to the same person, but they have very different meanings in certain contexts. And the, the referentialist and expressionalist model, where everything is just one sign lined up with one object, and it's just a link between the sign and the object, you can't really deal with this. Um, Frege talks about this at the beginning of Sense and Reference. I can read a little excerpt, although we're not really getting into Sense and Reference quite yet, but this might be helpful to explain it. In my, okay, so, he's asking, um, basically, he's saying that identity gives rise to challenging questions which are not altogether easy to answer. And he goes on a little bit and he says, In my big rift drift, I assumed that... Oh, sorry. That's, that's the wrong place to start reading. Anyways, he says this. A equals A and A equals B are obviously statements of differing cognitive value. A equals A holds a priori and, according to Kant, is to be labeled analytic, while the statements of the form A equals B often contain very valuable extensions of our knowledge and cannot always be established a priori. The discovery that the rising sun is not new every morning but always the same was a very great consequence to astronomy. Even today, the identification of a small planet or a comet is not always a matter of course. So what he's saying here is that thinking of identity in terms of simply anything that referring that refers to the same object is the same meaning is a little bit oversimplistic because Going back to the example with Superman, saying Clark Kent is Clark Kent is very different from saying Clark Kent is Superman, because one of those takes a lot of work to get to. You don't automatically know that Clark Kent is Superman in the same way that you know that Clark Kent is Clark Kent. So that's another thing that he's going to fix or attempt to fix in his system, um, sense and reference. And also, yeah, that's basically it. Um, the next thing that he went to address in his system that was a problem with the previous one is the case of belief statements and psychological verbs. And this is um, maybe a little bit more complicated. It's because belief statements are not truth functional. And I'll explain what that means. So truth functional statements are statements that are true and false based on the truth and falsity of their components. So that's a statement like there are cats and dogs, and is a truth functional connective. So it's saying there are cats is true, and there are dogs is true. So there are cats and dogs is true. Because this is truth functional, we can change out either of the two statements for something that has the same truth value, and this statement have the same truth value as well. So, for example, I could say, there are cats, and I am recording an ASMR video. That's still true, because I substituted 
That's right. Yeah. Then the retinal image of the observer, as he says it. So basically, what the person is seeing in their retina, literally, that is the conception, and that is private. No one else experiences exactly the same um, conception of looking at the moon through this because their retinas are different, etc., etc. And then, thirdly, and the most confusingly, is the sense. So, um, the optical image in the telescope is indeed one-sided and dependent upon the standpoint of observation, but it is still objective inasmuch as it can be used by several observers. So, he's not super duper clear here, and I think this is one of the, the, the flaws in um, his sense and reverence model, is that the sense, you kind of understand what it is, it's like this, the, the capability of this, this image being seen through a telescope to be seen by multiple people. And, yeah, I can know that's, that's communicable, because multiple people can experience it, but it's really, really, really unclear as to what exactly it is. I mean, intuitively, I can kind of understand it as, um, just the conception that's shareable, but He's not very specific as to what it is like he is um, to what everything else is, and it kind of gives it this magical, transcendental quality that I think goes against his goal of a completely, completely formal and perfect language. But anyways, that's a little bit of a digression, but hopefully you can kind of understand conception versus sense versus reference. Conception is private. Reference is the object itself, and sense is the sense of it, which is communicable, but also not the object itself, it's the sense of the object itself. I know I'm kind of using a circular definition here, but hopefully it makes sense. Another example he gives is um, of Bucephalus, which I think, <sighs> I might be wrong here, that it's Napoleon's horse. Um, and he says that the painter, the horseman, and the zoologist will probably connect different conceptions with the name Bucephalus. This constitutes an essential distinction between the conception and the sign sense. So, again, conception is completely, completely subjective, and sense is communicable. Um, this can constitutes an essential, an essential distinction between the proper, the conception and the sign sense, which may be common property of many, and therefore is not a part of the mode of an individual mind. For one can hardly deny that man has a common store of thoughts which is transmitted from one generation to another. So, he's saying that uh, different people will have different conceptions of what Bucephalus is but they all understand the same sense in the meaning of the word. Anyways, let's continue on. So, in addition to words having references, or, I guess, um, nouns having references, uh, he also thinks that sentences themselves have a reference. So, where does he say that? I believe it's one of the three pages here. Ah, uh, yes. I suppose I, we can talk about his example for um, what I did with Clark Kent and Superman. So he says, the thought of the sentence star is a body illuminated by the sun differs from that of the sentence the evening star is a body illuminated by the sun by the way the morning star and the evening star are both venus i didn't know that either when i first read this um but this is the example he gives um anybody who did not know that the evening star is the morning star might hold that one is true and the 
other is false. The thought accordingly cannot be the referent of the sentence, but must rather be considered as the sense. So, this is also relating to sentence structure, but also shows how you can't really substitute co-referential terms if they have different senses. Um, so, in the example, he was exploring the idea that there is also a the reference of a sentence would be the thought of what that means and how I think about it when I say the sentence. But he thinks that this obviously can't be true because um, when you substitute co-referential terms, that shouldn't change um, the way that we conceive of a sentence. Sorry, I'm not explaining this well. Yes, okay. So, I forgot about this last sentence. So, the, the important part of this is the thought accordingly cannot be the reference of the sentence, but must rather be considered as the sense. So, thought that I have when I say a sentence is the sense of the sentence, because the reference needs to be objective, because it, re it, it refers to some object in the world, so regardless of what I think about a given sentence, the, the reference of it must be the same, because the reference needs to be fully objective. So. The morning star is a body illuminated by the sun, and the evening star is a body illuminated by the sun. I might hold those, one of those to be true, and one of those to not be true, if I don't know that the morning star and the evening star are the same. But, um, nonetheless, they both have the same reference, which I'll explain what he thinks the reference of a sentence is later. Because the reference needs to be objective, so it can't depend on what I as an individual think, or what I think about the sense of that, because it needs to be completely, completely objective. Um, he continues, uh, also, well, I'll do that example later, because now we're already on this train of thought about what the reference of a sentence is. So. is that because the reference must be objective, he comes to the conclusion that we have seen that the referent of a sentence may always be thought whenever the reference of the components are involved, and that this is the case when and only when we are inquiring after the truth value. We are therefore driven into accepting the truth value of a sentence as its referent. So, basically what he's saying there is that sentences are also symbols, and they refer to a truth value, either true or false. So that is the reference of a sentence, because that is then objective. And regardless of whether I know that Superman is Clark Kent, or that the morning star is the evening star, in those two examples, if I use a sentence with either, with either of them and I swap them out, then the reference will be the same, and it's only the sense that changes. So that, that solves the problem of substituting co-referential terms, which the previous model couldn't deal with because it didn't have the concept of sense, which differentiated the terms. So, um, now let's go back 
Odysseus, as in the fictional character. Then, Odysseus does not refer, so therefore the sentence does not refer. So, because it has a sense, even if it doesn't have a reference, Odysseus is still meaningful. And also, even though Odysseus might not have a reference, that does not make the sentence broken in any way, because the sentence having a reference to true or false also requires that the, the words in the sentence have a reference, so you can't evaluate a sentence unless both the words and the sentence itself have a referent. So, in this case, because Odysseus does not have a referent in my mind, and I'm the person saying Odysseus was laid asleep on the shores of Ithaca, then that sentence also does not evaluate to true or false, because I'm saying it in a way where it doesn't have a reference. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not sure if I explained that the best, but... Basically, in order for a sentence to be a true or false, all of the things inside of it need to have a reference, and if they only have a sense, then you can't evaluate the sentence itself as true or false. Okay. So, that is basically the core of Frege's sense and reference model. And let's review. So, in sense and reference, meaning is comprised of a trichotomy between signs, sense, and reference. And the reference is the object. The sense is the abstract but shareable entity that ascribes specific meaning to whatever we're talking about. And the sign is, well, the sign, it's how you're referring to whatever you're talking about. So like Clark Kent versus Superman or the Morning Star versus the Evening Star. And then the reference of sentences is true or false, and sentences require all of their words that make them up to also have reference in order for them to have a reference. Um, I have a few more quotes that I like as well that kind of help communicate what he's talking about, so. Uh, just to clarify why he thinks that sentences, um, the reference is true or false, he says this, and I think it's, I just liked the way that it sounded. If now the truth value of a sentence is its referent, then on the one hand, all true sentences have the same referent, and so on the other hand, do all false sentences. From this, we see that in the referent of the sentence, all that is specific is obliterated. We can never be concerned only with the referent of a sentence. But again, the mere thought alone yields no knowledge, but only the thought together with its referent, i.e. its truth value. I just liked the quote, in the referent of the sentence, all that is specific is obliterated. It's kind of poetic language. Anyways. rest of the paper um, basically is him addressing edge cases, which I guess we could go over a few, and then talk about um, maybe some flaws that the system has. So, let's see. Um, the first thing that he says is that of a sentence is not always its truth value. Um, namely, when the sentence has an indirect referent that's not an exact quote, but basically, he has this concept of indirect reference um, to deal with things like quotes. Um, so when I'm quoting a sentence from someone else, I'm not actually asserting the sentence, I am referring to the time when someone else said it. So, it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve the same logical purpose as a normal sentence would. Um, so, you don't 
the same way because I'm just communicating the sense of what they said and not actually the reference um, because I'm quoting them and not actually saying that what I'm saying in quoting them is a judgment like I would be if I said something normally. What else? sense. 
sentences. So that's why he includes, we can't replace the earth by the planet which is accompanied by a monus diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own. Because of course that's the most simple thing you could think to replace. <laughs> his examples are kind of funny sometimes, but that shows how his system deals with
many problems in math and in politics and in science because people say things that don't actually make sense like the will of the people it refers to something that seems really definite but there is actually no will of the people in Frege's opinion that's not something that can be easily established or even established at all there's no as he says there is no generally accepted referent for this expression but nonetheless people use it and because of that people can make claims that seem far far more established than they actually are in reality to Freca because they're using an imperfect language so Part of his goal, and also Russell's goal, was to create a perfect language in which misunderstandings like that couldn't happen, because it would be unable to have ambiguities like that that lead to so many problems. So that kind of shows how it's a little bit of a noble cause to try and construct the system of language, even if it didn't end up working. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say it didn't end up working. I'm sure there's some philosopher somewhere, depending. Sounds in a reference in some modified form. Um, because that's how philosophy works. People can... There's someone defending every position out there, really. Anyways, let's continue. Oh, I have a star here. Let's see what that is. start. 